My topic for tonight is uh, the mistake of calling evil good and good evil. Mighty God, mighty God, I'm going to ask you to share the lives before I go into preaching. Karen, when you find the song, you can just play it. Most righteous Father, we thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, I am just a vessel. I am nothing. Father God, I am nothing, Jesus. My people cry. So, my say, God, here I am before you, Jesus. In dark and sin. Here I am before you, Jesus, tonight, God. Father God, here I am as your vessel. Lord, nothing good that I have done, but God, you are the creator. You design and you, Father God, align all things unto you. So, Father God, you have chosen me for this role, God, for your purpose and for your will. Let it be done, mighty God, as you said, Jesus. Lord, this is your word, mighty God. Your word without your power and your grace is just win. Lord, the people upon the life don't just come to see me. Lord Jesus, but they come to hear of what you have to say. So tonight, let that which you have to say, Father God, come to pass. And mighty God, I pray that you'll pierce their hearts, Jesus. Lord, I repent, mighty God, on behalf of myself, my Hosanna, my entire generation, God. Whatever will block your word tonight, I command it to get out of the way. And Father God, let your word go flowingly, freely, unhindered. Mighty God, I pray tonight, uh, that the angels that you set over this life will begin to minister to the hearts of your people. Father God, you are the only God that can save. You are the only God that can truly touch your people. Father God, you are mighty, you are powerful. You are king of kings, you are Lord of Lord. Lord, you are the conquering land of Judah. You are the I am that I am. You are the way, the truth, and the light. Father God, our eyes are the light. Lord, enlighten our eyes, our entire body can be lightened tonight, Jesus. As we come tonight, Lord, we ask of you, Lord. Uh, Lord, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Help us to be close to you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God, I thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Mighty God, I love you tonight, Jesus. Mighty God, we worship you. We worship your Holy Spirit. God, I worship you, God. I have heard my people. Mighty God, we thank you, Jesus. All who dwell in dark and sin. God, I worship you, Jesus. My hand will save. Jesus. I who made the stars of night. I will make their dark. Bright, who will bear my light to them? Oh, God, we thank you, Jesus. Whom shall we thank you, Holy Spirit? As we enter into the word tonight, I'm going to ask you to place your mind upon the word. And I'm going to ask you tonight. So, so just let your atmosphere be free from distractions that are going to the world. Let me sing the song. No, so Sister Karen can find it. Lord, here I am, Lord. Take me and use me. Lord, I surrender my whole heart to you. Lord, thy all I give, and I lie for you I live. Take me and use me. Lord, I'm yours. Just sing that song in your personal space. Here I am, Lord. You're giving back yourself to God. Take me and use me. Lord, I surrender my whole life to you. You're telling that you're surrendering everything. Lord, I all I give and a life for you I live. Take me and use me. Lord, I'm yours. 
Father, we recognize tonight that we belong to you, Lord. We may have strayed away, God. We may have entered the wrong path. But tonight, God, we are saying, here we are, God. We are saying the purpose that you created us for, mighty God. We are asking you to realign us tonight, Jesus. And we are saying, God, we surrender all to you tonight. Father, blow upon us another time. Breathe upon us afresh. Refresh us in your presence, mighty God. My, my topic for tonight the, mis the mistake of calling evil God and good evil. I'm ready to go into the word. My, my first scripture is Isaiah 5, verse 20 to 21. It says, What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil. The dark is light and the light is dark. That bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves so clever. You see, in, in a world where there's so much deception, where there's so much darkness, but yet so much light, we have to be very careful and we have to ask God to increase discernment because we're in a time where good has been seen as bad and evil has been seen as good. We're in a time where if we are not careful, we'll be so easily deceived by what is happening around us. You see, this mindset never started with us. It started in the Garden of Eden where, where we are just a product of what took place in that garden. You see, Genesis 3, verse 2 to 3 says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat nor shall you touch it lest you die. Verse 6. I'm going to jump down to verse 6. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for eat, for food. Remember, it's the same tree that a woman said in verse 2 to 3, said that God said you must not touch it, nor you must not eat of it. But in verse 6, what happened between verse 2 and verse 3? Why, by the time it reaches verse 6, the woman, it says, when she saw that tree, what she saw, she saw that the food was good to eat. Pleasant to her eyes. And the tree desired to make one wise. She took, she took of it and eat of it. So when I tell that, that deception did not start with us. It started in the garden. Where Eve saw good as evil and evil as good. Because she was warned of this that do not take of it and eat it. You see, the ability to follow what was good was a struggle from in the garden. No, he saw what God said was not good to eat as, as pleasure or as pleasant. This deception led us also today to struggle to know what is good and what is evil. This was a corrupted mindset from the beginning. That is why Proverbs 12 verse 15 says, Fools think their, their own ways is right, but the wise listen to others. He said that time he, he, he did not listen to the instruction of God. She was deceived by a serpent. Remember, the serpent was the cunning, was a cunning animal. He, the serpent was wise than any other animal in the garden. Many, many of us think that Satan turned into a serpent. Satan did not turn into a serpent. The serpent was a vessel for Satan to use at that time, just as though we are vessels. And, and, if, and if we are not mindful, we allow Satan to use us. If you read the Bible, how Lucifer looks, he's full of pearls and gem and nice. So listen, don't be deceived. 
Faith I did not go into the garden and turn into a snake. The snake was already there. The Bible said he was one, he was the most cunning and wise of all the animals. So many times when we read it, we think that Satan went into the garden and turned into a snake. No. So, so this animal was an animal that, that because Satan knows tragedy, if this animal is cunning and wise, obviously he knows the right words to speak to Eve. We have to be careful in our time now. We're because of the right words person use or we think it's the right words that deceive us into believing things that we should not believe we may think we are actually doing good but actually we are practicing what is wrong look at peter as a good example he loved jesus in fact he was one of the three that was in the inner circle with god But this did not stop Satan from using his vessel. This did not stop Satan, mighty God, from entering his mindset. For him to speak words that sound good, but yet evil. In the natural human sense, you think that Peter was doing something good to God. To Jesus, because we're saying that he loved Jesus and is consoling Jesus. But it said not because the word sounded good mean that it was good. No. We have to be careful. Or we entertain evil thinking it is good. Matthew 16, verse 21 to 23 said, From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem. And that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be he would rise from the dead. Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him or restrain him, correct him. Saying, such things, heaven forbid, Lord, he said. This will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. The word sounded good, but yet it was evil. We have to be careful of what we entertain, what we believe is good and what we believe it is evil. Peter weren't taking in what God was saying. Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying that I had to do this. I have to die. I am going to die, but I'm going to raise. That missed Peter totally. So in his human sense, he's like, no, this can happen to you. You are the Messiah. You are Jesus. Be careful how we give emotional advice. You see, he was seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from Jesus' point of view. You see, Peter did not grasp the full concept of what, why God, why Jesus had to die. He, even though he walked with him, he did not grasp the full purpose of why Jesus came on earth. Be careful how you do not know the purpose of person. They're calling what they're called to do. And when you see they grow, going through certain things, you give them advice out of emotion, thinking that you're doing something good and you lure them off the path that God has set for them. Be careful how you speak into person's destiny. You see, Peter never understand that he, his words was going to interrupt the destiny of Jesus. If Jesus was a mere man, he would have forfeited the purpose why he was born. At that time, Peter saw it as good. But in essence, it was not good. It was evil. Because it was the evil of Satan to, to, to now detour Jesus from his purpose. Before we give advice, we need to find out from God. What is the purpose of this person? Why is this person put on this? on this track why is this person going through this purpose why are they going through this process not because you're going through something mean that it's evil 
It is aligned to your destiny. But because you do not know, you think that it's evil. And a person who do not know your destiny, that they are doing you something good, and Satan just speak a good word into their ears for them to come and tell you. So giving emotional advice is a trap. And, and it is an evil to the person who you're giving that advice to when you do not know the destiny of the person. The truth is you wouldn't think that it is evil because you think you're doing your, 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 the person good. You think that you're helping the person. But when, but when you do that, you interfere with a person's destiny. You become an open door for Satan to use. Peter saw good and called it evil. Before you give advice, consult God. Do not give advice from emotion. Do not operate from your emotion because emotion will cause you to get into problem. And that's why I always tell emotional people, be careful, check your emotion. Because when, when, when you are very emotional, Satan see you as a toy to play with your emotion. And that's why the Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. So here we may look at it and think that, oh, it was good. But here Christ, dear Jesus, heard to the man and said, Peter, get thee behind thee, Satan. You're a trap to me. Don't become a trap to person thinking that you are doing good. For example, the, the Holy Spirit may speak to you to do something. To your friends, to your family, it is foolishness. It is foolishness to them. And they're like, why God would tell you that? Why would you want to do that? And they may criticize the judge, they speak all sort of things. But the truth is, you are sent here for a different destiny. You are sent here for a different purpose. They may never understand. But if, if God, if the Holy Spirit is ministering to you to do a specific thing, don't let the evil advice of others cause you not to go ahead and do what God tell you to do. Don't do that. Because at the end of the day, it is going to affect you, affect your future and the entire generation. By the time you catch up with, with knowing that it was not them, but it was an evil spirit speaking good through them to trap you. You, what you what you should have done may have passed already. And those lives which you should have impacted may have already wasted. Listen, you need to ask God for the spirit of discernment. That's a perfect example of thinking that good is evil and evil is good. Peter made that mistake. We have to learn from the same thing. What, what do we see as evil, right? We see murderers, witchcraft workers, person being envious and jealous, and oh, we, we see that as being evil. So you may even say to yourself that I'm not evil because I never did these things. But evil though, evil come in more than one ways. Satan is very subtle as, as well as he can be very aggressive. Remember the word of God said, none is good. Romans 3 verse 10, as the scripture says, no one is righteous, not even one. Mark 10 verse 18 says, Why do you call me good? Jesus asks. Only God is truly good. This means that all of us have the ability to sin. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we may not see it as that way, right? The first one, double-mindedness. That is sin. It means that you're unstable and you lack faith in God. So today, this is something that I tell people not to practice. If God said to you, you're going to get an apple. This is you. God said, I'm going to get an apple. God said, I'm going to get a. By the time all of those persons give you advice, you start to think, am I really going to get that apple? Can I really do this? Fear start to take you over. Now you're praying, you're praying for this apple. And God said you're going to get the apple. And then your mind be begin to, to wonder, do I really need the apple? Am I going to get it? I don't know if I want it. You're, you're, you're unstable in your mind. The angel that God sent to work with you 
to bring you to the process for you to achieve that apple is now confused. All of us have assigned angels. That, that is a sign to bring us to a certain process. We're never alone. God never left us alone. So you become unstable and confused in your mind. And, and God is waiting to know what do you really want. You pray at once a job. Then you start wondering, God, I really want to work there, so God, I really want to work there. No, you're confused. What do you want? Me? Know what you want before you place it before God. And you may think that double-mindedness is just normal. No, it is unstable and God speak about it. It's evil thing. God doesn't like it. But yet we practice it. But we do not see it as being sinful or even being evil. We don't understand that we will come a portal now for the enemy. When no, we no begin to doubt God. And you're like a wave, mighty God. That is James 1, verse 6 to 8. The next one, speaking, the next point, speaking kind words to cover what is truly in your heart. That is evil. Matthew 12, verse 34 to 36. The truth is, you think something evil of the person, but you speak good out of your mouth to cover how you really feel about the person. It is wrong. It is wrong. We don't see those things as being evil because we're like, oh, that's just normal thing. It's not a murder. It's not, it's, it's not somebody committing suicide or something like that. But the truth is, it is evil and it is wrong. You cannot say something in your heart but against the person. For example, in your heart, you said, I blows a little good upon the person. I tell her, what are them put on? Just an example. When the person, you get close to the person, oh, I like your blows. Well, it look lovely on you. You're wicked. In your heart, you know, say wicked against the person because you never do think that in your heart. It is wrong. Doing good deed, but really want to see evil happen to the person. Ecclesiastic 12, verse 14. I always say this doing a good deed for me does not mean that you're with me. No. You can do something good, but pray for the end result to turn out bad. But you do the good deed because you want you, 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 because you're covering what you really want to see the outcome happen. It is wrong. For example, somebody may be looking at job and they give you a resume. And you say, boy, you know, I send out your resume and all that. But the truth is, you probably pray, say God, mega sent to because I don't want them no say. I don't want them to get the job. And you, you speak a bad word over it. Don't let them get the job. But yesterday, tell the person, I send it me all over the place. And the person feel good thinking that you're actually doing something to help them. When they know in your heart that they don't really want to get the help. You don't really want to get the help. And, and your words and your thought become a weapon against them. That is wickedness. Ecclesiastic 12 verse 14. The next one. Thinking that you're better than others. Romans 12 verse 3 to 5. Thinking that you're better than others. Romans 12 verse 3 to 5. You see, God made each of us special and we need each of us. Last week I spoke about grace. Each of us carry a grace. Each of us carry a different grace. So we may need we need, we may need each other grace. I may be going through something that you are grace for. So we we need each other. We are each unique and special in the eyes of God. That is Romans 12, verse 3 to 5. Commenting on an incident without the full report. Wickedness, false witness. You weren't there. One person tell a part of the story. And you believe the one person, you begin to, to, to spark judgment, you begin to speak about it, you, you begin to take side. Deep in your heart, you know you take the side before the next side of the story. You begin to say things about the other person, whether it be a family member, whether it be a stranger, whether it be a workplace, I don't care where it is, it's wrong. It is wrong. Proverbs 19 verse 9, speak about it. It is wrong. If you do not know the full status to keep your mouth closed, or simply say, 
I was not there, so I cannot pass judgment. I was not there, so I cannot pass judgment. You can listen and you can say, listen, I cannot comment on it because I was not there. As Christians, we have to learn and be careful how we use our mouth. Be careful of our action. Be careful of we thinking that, that yes, we are doing something good. No, when I ask in essence, we are doing evil and it is in the Bible that it is evil. One of the things that catch us the most, uh, a family member that we may prefer, a family member that we may love may call us and tell us something. You're probably not too close to the next family member what they're telling you about, you know. You're probably not even in good relationship with the next family But because of that, you're willing to listen and to criticize and to tell you it is wrong. Wrong is wrong and right is right. It doesn't matter what the relationship you guys have. If you weren't there, you weren't there. Doesn't matter how truthful you think the person is. Doesn't matter if you think the person will tell you any lie. You was not there. How are you going to pass judgment and commit? You weren't there. You simply say, I was not there when this thing was taking place. And you leave it at that. Or you say, it's best the both of you are here where I can hear the two sides of story. Because you can get into problem because of that. And God does not like that. The next one. Causing division wherever you go. Whether in family, whether at the workplace, anywhere you go. Listen to me. Romans 16, verse 17 to 18. Romans 16, verse 17 to 18. The Bible wanted to watch out for these persons. The Bible said, watch out. You can go and read the Bible verse on them. You know, I'm giving you these scriptures. You can't sit over the Bible study for the week. Go back and read these scriptures. Go back, read them, make your own little notes on them. The Bible says, watch out for them. Be careful of person who cause division in family, in the workplace, in places where you go. Be careful, the Bible says, watch out for them. Why? Because these people are told me, that's why the, that's why the Bible says, watch out for them. Romans 16, verse 17 to 18. They leave from the, the auntie to the next auntie to the uncle to the cousin till then a whole big mix up happen. And you wonder how our family becomes so divided and mixed up because they know why too much gossiping and hearsay, too much hideliness. And what hurtful about if these persons are Christian? It is wrong. It is wrong. If you know you're going to tell your brother something or your sister something, whether in Christ or in your blood family, if you know you're going to say it, that's going to cause problems, do not say it. It is evil because now you set family against each other for no reason. Brother against each other, sister against each other. Do not say it. Do not do it because you cause contention. You must know the maturity of the person. You most of the person is mature enough to deal with it. If you are not resolving the issue, keep your mouth closed. Don't add to it. The only way you can open your mouth unless you are resolving the issue. If you're not resolving it, shut your mouth and you move on. We need to learn these things as Christians. Mighty God. And then it cause this big confusion. And these people like to take themselves out of it. They like to tell them that they never do anything. They're like serpents, very slippery and cunning. It is wrong. You must not do it. So if something going to cause your brother to fall, if something going to cause family to be against each other, keep your mouth closed. Do not say it. Pray in secret. Let me tell you something. I will hear things. I do not know if it's true or lie. I have I have been a witness. You know what I do? I go into my closet and I pray for the person. And I pray and I say, God, let the truth be revealed. I say, God, keep them. I say, God, if this is what they're doing, turn them away from me. I don't go open my mouth. I don't know. I don't go tell nobody else. I don't know. If, if my family member call me, I, don't, I do not know. I tell them, I say, I don't know about this situation. Let us pray about it. They're on the line. They can't tell you that. I don't run that joke. You will never hear me call the person. I never mention it. Because I have, I have no witness of that. And that can cause 
TV John, that can't cause the mice that can cause the war. And God said, we should learn to live with at peace with all man as possible as we can. The next one, pretending to love someone either for a gain or just for the person to think you are with them is evil. It's wrong. Romans 12, verse 9 to 11. This, so, this, this scripture teach you that you don't pretend to love somebody, really love them. Whether in relationship, whether in friendship, whether in family, no. Don't pretend to love people, really love them. It is hard, it is hard and hurtful when person truly love you and you you pretend to love them. And you know in your heart that you don't really love the person. It is hurtful. And sooner or later, it will come out in the light. Because nothing in the dark stay hidden. Nothing in the dark stay hidden. No. It will come out to light. So don't pretend to love so because of gain. Because these things, you don't see them as being evil. You just say, oh, everyday life. No. It's wicked. It is wicked. Don't do that. If you love somebody, really love them. But don't pretend to love person because of a gain. No. Competition. This one is killing the church. Philippians 2, verse 3 to 4. Philippians 2, verse 3 to 4. Let's say again. Philippians 2, verse 3 to 4. This one tell them not to be selfish. Don't try to impress others, but, but try to help each other. So let go competition. Most time competition is amongst friends, amongst family, and probably in, and in your workplace. Why do human compete? Most time they, they, they compete because they want to, to say that they're above the person. They compete because uh, probably growing up, they didn't have much, and they think that I should have it all now. It depends on the mindset of the person where they take on that spirit. I should have more than what you are. I should have better than what you have. It is okay to want to have good things, but it's not okay to, to want to compete with each other to say that you're better than them. No. And we may see it and say, oh, this is nothing. This is human thing. No, the Bible speaks against it. You should not do it. Showing kindness just to say I help the person. Just to go back and say I help the person. That is not good either. Matthew 6, verse 1 to 4. Matthew 6, verse 1 to 4. If you're helping the person, help them from a righteous heart. Help them from a kind place. Don't help them just to go back and say, is I help you. No. Be grateful to God. If you want to speak, speak and glorify God. God, I Thank you that you saw me fit as a vessel to carry out such purpose. I thank you, God, that you, mighty God, has allowed me to do this good thing to honor your name. So this person can now testify of your goodness. But don't go gossiping if I never help the person. They want to hear so the person that they want to reach. No, it is wrong. It is wrong. Don't do it. This is a killer in relationship. Saying hurtful words to satisfy your hurt. The person may say something to you and you probably feel hurt. And you look for some worse hurt words if someone else so. To go and tell them. To tell them but because it satisfies your hurt. It is wrong. It is wrong. Who will be the peacemaker in that marriage? Who will be the peacemaker in that relationship? Who will be the peacemaker in that family? So if the person hurt you, tell the person you hurt you by saying this. But don't go dig up a hurtful more or something to tell the person satisfy your hurt. It is wrong. That's why marriage are breaking, relationship are breaking, friendship is breaking, family is breaking. Because nobody knows how to be at peace. In Jamaica, we have the thing that two bull care in now one pen, and it's true. Somebody has to choose to be humble. It is better you forgive and move on. So you're looking for more hurtful words to tell the person to satisfy how you feel is wrong. You will see that has been wrong, right? Because they always them first hurt me. It's wrong. It is wrong. Matthew 12, verse 36 to 37. 
Matthew 12, verse 36 to 37. You can read it and see that it is wrong. <clears throat> the next point of partiality. Deuteronomy 1, verse 17. Partiality. Deuteronomy 1, verse 17. The Bible tells us how we should not show partiality. And many times, people do this because they want to be favored by one person or they favor one person or the next person. It is wrong. For me, when you're wrong, you're wrong. For me, when you're wrong, you're wrong. I'm going to say that you're wrong. For me, when you're wrong, you're wrong. You see, I have two sisters. You see, if, if, if one, if any of them wrong, that I, I'm not, I'm not going to tell the bigger one that she's wrong and then tell the smaller one, oh, you're my baby. So no, from you're wrong, you're wrong. So I'm telling you, I don't care if I don't tell you vets. Most of them probably vets. But I don't be so fair when I don't tell you vets. At least I tell the truth. When you look in yourself, you're going to realize I just did, did, did you a favor. Wrong is wrong and right is right. I'm not going to say I'm close to this one, so I'm going to pity this one. Uh, if I tell them wrong, I don't tell them so strong. But even when that one year wrong, because when I'm so close, I'm going to tell them when I'm more stronger, it is wrong. Partiality is partiality. It's just a cross cut the board. You don't you, you, you don't partial whatever you do. If the if if my sisters are wrong, they are wrong. I'ma tell them so they're wrong. The next one, compromise. Compromise. Psalms one Psalms 119, verse 1 to 8. Psalms 119, verse 1 to 8. Acceptance of person wrong behavior because you want to be there, be on your good side. You know, you said, me, me, I leave them and I tell them, I'll come down with one about the cussing. So you compromise. You know it wrong, but because you don't know, want them cut you or them cuss you or them don't be afraid, you do what them say. And in your heart, you say, God, me no feel good, me shouldn't be seen. By yourself, you don't me shouldn't be seen because this is not right. No, wrong is wrong. You do not compromise on nothing at all. Stand up for your righteousness. Stand up for you believe in. Do not compromise. If they can't, if they can't accept what you believe in, then if two can't agree, they can't walk. Obviously, you're going to part. This happened many times when when person just turned Christian. They they had they were probably in a group of friends, and you know the group of friends probably smoke us, but but they still want to be there because they don't want them to think that oh. Because I turn, because I turn Christian, or because I give my life to God, um, and I'm with you, but I know I think that better than no. You have to part. We don't go in two different roads. They don't compromise. And the job, you don't compromise. The boss don't tell you to teeth, and you compromise and teeth because you want to keep the job. At the end of the day, what if you go? What if you're on your way home and making an accident and die? The boss that left can go and repent, but you dead in sin. So don't compromise. For anybody because, be, be, because of money or anything at all. The Bible speak about it. Speak about bribes. The next one. Exodus 23 verse 8. Justifying others wrong. The person does something wrong. But you want to cover for them. You justify why they do it wrong. You justify why they're wrong. No. You tell the person that they're wrong. And you speak loudly that they're wrong. You don't justify before others. Oh, they did this because um they, they, they went through this uh, or because they felt no wrong is wrong. Emotional, emotional behavior does not cover up wrong. So if your husband wrong him wrong, if your children wrong them wrong, you don't justify why they are wrong because they know you're going to create a monster. And you're going to wonder how am I going to control this child? How how in this marriage? What am I going to do because I justify why every time my husband do me something wrong? No. Wrong is wrong. You have to let them know that it is wrong. Don't justify when persons are... Parents, so, some parents like to do this. Justify why their children... Wrong is wrong. If your children, some of your children, their child did it. You don't justify, oh, and they did because of this. No. Wrong is wrong. It's your duty not to teach them how should you handle this behavior next time. But if you justify why why they did this, why they do that, they, when the situation occurs again, how they're going to handle it? Is, is that the parent now wants to go to close? 
and wash the trial also and wash away all evidence. It is wrong. The next one, the last pointer, Galatians 5, verse 13. Force in our country is supposed to do what they do not want to do. This is, the, listen, this is witchcraft. We practice that over no. Only witchcraft forces you to do something against your will. But because we're not going to a witch doctor or a witch place who thinks uh, it's witchcraft. Only witchcraft forces, listen. For example, the person said this is green. And the person said, let me try it to see. You come with yourself. It is blue if you try to wear feel. And no, don't do that. The Bible said, God give us free will. Let the person exercise their free will. Let the person learn. Either they make a mistake and they learn from that mistake. Don't laugh at them. Oh, they tell you. You're wrong. It is witchcraft. Because they want to force the person to do something that they did not want to do. Would that be your children, your husband, your family member? You are wrong. Let them exercise the God-given right of freedom. Freedom to think. Freedom to go to God for themselves. Freedom to express how, what they want to express in that moment. But some of us, we, we, we are so controlling. I want to control everybody thinking. They want to want to control what people do. We cannot do that. Give them a chance. How are they going to develop and grow? No. We cannot do that. So the person come with an idea. It's not shutting down. I start to thinking all sort of evil things going to happen. Give the idea a chance. Help the person along the way. Say, let us discuss it to see how best we can put it in place. Instead of shutting it down. Or oh, don't do that. Don't. No. Because you don't know if when that thought came, it was never a thought from God. But because of your poisonous mouth, you just cause the person to disobey God. Military relationship that take place. Let me tell you something. You see, the host will tell me something. My husband cannot tell me not to know what God says. Because in all things, I put God first. That every day, the same God I have to pray to keep my family and keep my husband and keep, keep my children. So I don't pray to come on to God. So we have to be very careful what we do. And we think that we are doing a good thing, not knowing that we are doing something evil. What do we see as being good? We may see good as, as everything going right. And uh, we may see good as we live in righteous, living a happy life. We may see good. Well, let us look at Paul and see how Paul saw good. Second Corinthians 11, verse 23 to 27. Paul says, I have worked hard, been put in prison more often. Been whipped times without number, mighty God, and forced uh, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jews' leader gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was torn. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day drift at sea. I have traveled on many long journey. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from many, from my own people, the Jew, as well as from the Gentile. I have faced danger in the cities, in the desert, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers, but are not. I have worked hard and long. During many sleepless nights, I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I shiver in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Second Corinthians 7, he says, Even though I have received such wonderful revelation from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. In the moral of the story, if, if, if you go back and read 2 Corinthians 11, you can read all of it. Paul was saying that I can boast of all the good things, the vision, the revelation I got from God. 
I can boast of all of that. But he said that that will 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 actually put him in a spot as if he is strong, right? Put him in a spot as if he is he is perfect. But he began to say, "Let me boast about my weakness, about the things that I've gone through that men will not see as good." Why? Because he said that these things keep him from being proud. What does it hear? It reminds him that he's human and he's not God. It reminds him that, listen, he needs God. Because through those period of time, he needed God. So though we may look on the situation and say, what an evil happened to this man, how wicked it could be. But in Paul's eyes, he said that these things keep him grounded. It keep him from becoming prideful. So though he was blessed, he had revelation, angel visitation, he had word from God. He had, he 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 was a great apostle. He said what kept him grounded was the things that he went through. We will look at it and say, oh, this could never be gone. But to Paul, Paul said, this was what kept me being human. This was what kept me from becoming proud and prideful. Because many times when God begins to use us, pride step in. And God has to remind us that he is God. And we're just the vessel, mighty God. So Paul kept these things as a reminder that God is God and he's just a vessel. So we may look at it and say, what a hard life this man has. But he saw it as being good. Because that is what kept him closer to God. Because every time he goes through something, he remembers that, that he needs God, mighty God. So even though he could boast on many different things, he chose to boast, uh, mighty God, on uh, what he has gone through. All the things that we may see as evil that he has gone through, he saw it as being God. Uh, mighty God, let us look at Jesus. John 19. <laughs> John 19, I'm going to read verse 1 to 7. I'm going to jump down to 17 to 19, then 28. I'll tell you what I'm reading. I'm going to read from 1 to 7. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a leather tip whip that must be hot. Excuse me. The soldiers wove a crown of torn and put of, of thorns. So they use a thorn, they put it in, they, they, they weave it into a crown and they put it on his head. And they put a purple robe on him. And they say, verse 3, Hail the king of Jews. They mocked as they slapped him across his face. Verse 4. Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I am going to bring him out to you now. But understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorn on and the purple robe. And Pilate said, look, here is the man. Verse 6. When they saw him, the leading priest and temple guard began shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Take him yourself and crucify him, Pilate said. I find him not guilty. The Jews leader replied, by our law he ought to die because he calls himself the son of God. Verse 17, I'm jumping on to verse 17. Carrying the cross by himself, he went to he went to the place called the place of skull. 18. There they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side, with Jesus between them. And Pilate posted. A sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jew. Verse 28. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And, and to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. 
verse 28. I want you to understand what Jesus said. Remember, he was going through all of that. Excuse me. He was going through all of that. And in verse 28, it said that Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. It was, a, it was his purpose to die for us. We may see him on the cross and say, my God, what a wickedness. Look what they nail him. Look what they pierce him side. Look how blood and water flow from him. Look what they spit on him. Look what they mock. Look what they whip him. But he did all of that just for us. He did all of that just, mighty God, for his purpose and the mission to be fulfilled, where we will be, re where we will be reunited with Christ. You may go through things that you may see it as being detrimental or being evil, but you don't understand that you are fulfilling your mission. You are fulfilling your purpose, mighty God. So do not see evil as good and good as evil. Because you don't know whose life you're touching when you're going through something and you're sharing it. And they're like, my God, if God strengthened you, it can strengthen me. And you gave that person hope. God did not call it in the process that he had to go through on the cross evil. He said that his mission was finished and he has fulfilled his purpose. We don't understand the sacrifice it takes. To actually fulfill your purpose. We think that things will come easy. Once it comes easy, it is good. No, it's not like that. Let us look at the blind man. The man that was born blind. John 9 verse 1 to 11. He said, As Jesus was walking along, He saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciple, asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sin? Or his parents' sin? It was not because of his sin or his parents' sin, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the task assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. But while I am here in the, in the world, I am the light of the world. Verse 6. Then he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and spread the mud over, his, over, the, over the man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam, which this means saints. So the man went and washed and came back seen. His neighbor and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used, used to sit and beg? Verse 9, some said he was and others said no, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the one. They asked, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes. Sorry. And told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed and now I can see. I want you to realize something. Sometimes when we're going through things, people think that it's because of something wrong or a curse. So they saw the blindness as a curse and God said it was never a curse. It was to demonstrate the power of God. And this is what I want you to see. He said, we must quickly carry out the task assigned by, to us, by the one who sent us. So this man was, by, was blind from birth. And there was a task that was assigned to his blindness that they needed to carry it out. If Jesus was not there, may, maybe these disciples would have passed the man. Why? Because them that them that think are evil, why I'm still so. They would have passed. That assignment would not be fulfilled. Because if Jesus tell them, say, listen, it's not in mother curse or in father curse or in curse. This, this is actually done to show the power of God. And it's an assignment that must be carried out. 
That is what reached many of us. Why we're thinking, God, what should we do on earth? Why did you send us? Our assignment will pass it because we see it as evil. We saw it as curse. So thank God that Jesus was there to explain the situation to them that no, it was not evil. It was he, he was born blind just because of this day for this assignment to be done. What have you gone through and see it as evil and it was, it was supposed to be an assignment for you and because you see it as evil, you never do it. You never fulfill it. Because you're saying, oh, this cannot be God. Oh, why would God tell me to do that? Oh, why would God send me there? And you never go, and you never do it. You are like these disciples who, who, who saw the, the goodness of God and the power of God that should be that, that should be done and in that moment and thought it was evil. Mighty God. That's why I said before we open our mouth and say things, we need to consult God. Before we begin to judge people and judge what is happening, consult God. Because we may not know the, the purpose why he was sent on her blind just for that assignment. You realize they never hear anything more about him again? Same depart Red Sea and didn't do anything is because that it was fulfilled. He, he could see no. That was his testimony. That was the assignment. Come on earth blind and then you're going to be healed. People are going to wonder who healed and they're going to know that God is in the healing business. But we are sick, I will curse God. I will never say, God, how will this glorify you? Glorify yourself in me, mighty Jesus, so, so God can be glorified. Everything we see as death and doom and evil. No. We need to start consulting God. God, who am I going to tell this testimony? We need to start consulting God on things and stop seeing things as being evil and stop seeing good as evil and evil as being good. We need to reprogram our mindset so we can reach the place where God wants us to reach. Mighty God. You see, even in marriage, sometimes you have a dispute in, in, in your marriage and we see it as being evil and people begin to curse your marriage. Oh, them live bad. Oh, the man did this. Oh, the, even if even, even, even they're going to your husband fast, they're going to the wife fast, and they start to speak and they start to curse. And you don't know that the child that you went through in your marriage was never about you, was, was because God's going to use you to actually be that mending process in somebody else's marriage. But are you going to tell them something that you have no clue about? You can't tell me about marriage if you never have no problem in your marriage. If you never got through certain things, a marriage can only be strong when, when it goes through certain things and survives. Don't let anybody fool you. A marriage can only be strong when you go through certain things and you survive. But because of people mouth and what they will speak, they will speak and speak over your marriage. You have to know, break it and press it, God. Every deceiving words, every bad words, every dishonor words, every any how they say, God, break it and begin to cover your marriage. You don't know the strength of your marriage if you have never gone through anything. And the truth is, many of them are suffering their marriage and they will, ne they will never speak nor get help because they're ashamed. But because you will speak and you will seek help, they, oh, they, only your marriage is giving problem. Don't be deceived. Nobody marriage is perfect. I don't know why the host would let me to say that. But I'm saying that because of God. Listen to me. Do not be deceived. God can change anyone he can turn any marriage around he can turn any husband around he can turn any wife around you are, you just need to trust god i'm a living testimony trust god trust him and he will do the rest for you the enemy will always try to break a relationship break a marriage break friendship it will always try but are you going to are you going to be that vest that enemy can use no you have to stop up until the enemy said, listen, when I when, when I enter into this, I never enter for it to break. So do I die? You cannot break this. Mighty God. And in closing, it says, when we hear God wants to use us, we become so happy, but yet we, we, but yet we view the, the process as evil. When you hear that God is going to use as a mighty man, as a mighty man, we become so happy. But we view the process as being evil. 
The next time you hear how God's going to use the asking God, what, I, what do I have to go through to pay the sacrifice for it? You see, remember what God says in Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9. Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9. My thoughts are not are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. James 1, verse 19 to 20. James 1, verse 19 to 20. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness of God's desire. So get rid of all filthy and evil in your lives. And humble accept the word God has placed in your heart. For it has, for it has the power to save your soul. Don't let the thoughts of this world drown out the mind of Christ. Let let let's count, let's consult God. Let's consult God and His mind and the mind of Christ before condemning or thinking of something being evil. You see, it is hard to see something that seems hard as being good we need to understand that you got all oh god fit things together how oh, he fits the puzzle together the things that he does sometimes we, we don't have the full length of what is happening because we are human we may we may get information as you go along god may give us information as you go along so we don't see the full story we don't see the full puzzle so we have to be careful of what, what we speak of when we speak, you know, because we will come a blockage to our own self and not knowing that we are the one that is stopping us. So before we even consider anything as being bad and evil and begin to speak things and listen to me, you don't know what you have gone to and how God is, is ready to use it. You just need to be humble and say, God, help me to see what you see, to know what you know to understand what you understand so i mean i curse myself curse the process curse my destiny and curse my entire generation nor even others because of a wrong conception because of a wrong thinking wrong mentality as human we need to stop we need to re we need to reprogram our mind with the word of god and i turn back over to six of carry and say i do have a blessed night Come on, let's thank the Holy Spirit tonight. Let's thank him tonight for his word and thank the woman servant, mighty God, for unveiling herself unto God. It's all unto his glory in the mighty name of Jesus. So we thank her tonight. We thank her tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. And we thank the Holy Spirit tonight for using her for his glory in Jesus' name. We thank the Holy Spirit for using her tonight in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you tonight for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy, mighty God. We thank you, Abba, Father, for your word tonight, Daddy Jesus. Lord, as you, God, as it fit tonight, mighty God, to empower and to educate, oh God, the minds of your people through your woman servant, oh God. Truly, indeed, that is Jesus. Help us, mighty God, to gain wisdom, mighty God, from your word, oh God, and to apply them tonight in the name of Jesus. Father God, I pray that you'll bless your woman servant. I pray that, God, you will continue to cover, to guide, and to empower her, mighty God, to continue, mighty God, the task, the rule, the mandate that, God, you have entrusted within her, mighty God, for her to carry out. Father God, we thank you for the word tonight that is Jesus. The word that has already gone forward, mighty God. The word that has already spoken that is Jesus. Lord, tonight please, mighty God, I humbly ask that you'll help us, your people to apply these words, mighty God. Be careful of all we call, mighty God, evil, good and good, evil. Father God, help us, oh God, us of today to, mighty God, resist, mighty God, restrain ourselves from operating, oh God, in these things, oh God, that we have been able Defied mighty God that is wrong in the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, let us, oh God, be learned people tonight uh, that will learn, oh God, and bring our learning, oh God, to practice. Uh, mighty God, for the upliftment of the kingdom of God.
God, in Jesus' name. Father God, we place all things into your hands tonight. We thank you, Abba, Father, for the night season, and we bless your holy name. Father God, cover your people under your blood tonight. Let every household, oh God, be covered in the name of Jesus. Lord, let your people, mighty God, including myself, oh God, find rest tonight into your bosom tonight in the name of Jesus. According to your words, mighty God, in Psalms 4, verse 8, mighty God, perfect peace we ask of you tonight uh, father we thank you and we bless you for the night season as we give it back to you oh god and we trust that god you will keep us safe in jesus name amen and amen again people of god more, um people on zoom our friends on YouTube, our friends on Facebook, we thank you again for making it uh, Mount Zion Apostolic International Ministry. We also thank the Holy Spirit for unveiling himself tonight in the name of Jesus and we thank the woman servant. Now tonight, if you are unsaved, you don't need to unmute, but just repeat the sinner's confession wherever you are tonight. Uh, and it reads, Lord, I confessed with my mouth I am a sinner. Lord, I know that you are the God that is faithful and just to forgive me of all my sins. God, I acknowledge my sins before you and declare with my mouth tonight, Lord, that Jesus is Lord. And believe in my heart tonight that God, you raised Jesus from the dead. Lord, I repent now and turn to you. God, wipe my sins away and refresh me in your presence. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen and amen. People of God, what a night it was. We thank God, we thank him for his word. Remember, we meet tomorrow morning for our morning devotion, 5 a.m. in the United States, uh, no, 5 a.m. in Jamaica, 5, 15 a.m. in Jamaica, 6, 15 a.m. in the United States. Until then, Let's do the benediction and then we will go. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give unto you his peace. Until we meet again, family, do have yourself.